With the fifth message in this series, we turn to the second chapter of Peter's first epistle. However, since this is actually one long letter, originally there were no chapter breaks. And here, as occurs elsewhere from time to time, the chapter break is poorly placed, since the second chapter is continuing a theme introduced at the end of chapter one, and which I dealt with in my previous message. Therefore, to maintain context, I shall begin reading from the final four verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. So if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'll begin at verse 22, and I'm doing a lot from the Amplified today. Verse 22. Since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your hearts for the sincere affection of the brethren, see that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. You have been regenerated, born again, not from a mortal origin or seed, but from one that is immortal, by the ever-living and lasting word of God. For all flesh, mankind is like grass, and all its glory and honor like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower drops off. But the word of the Lord, the divine instruction of the gospel, endures forever. And this word is the good news which was preached to you. So, be done with every trace of wickedness, depravity, malignity, and all deceit and insincerity, pretense, hypocrisy, and grudges, envy, jealousy, and slander, and evil speaking of every kind. Like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk, that by it you may be nurtured and grow into completed salvation. Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, come to him then, to that living stone, which men tried and threw away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come, and like living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For thus it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, honored, precious chief cornerstone, and he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, shall never be disappointed or put to shame. To you then who believe, who adhere to, trust in and rely on him, is the preciousness. But for those who disbelieve, it is true. The very stone which the builders rejected has become the main cornerstone, and a stone that will cause stumbling, and a rock that will give men offense. They stumble because they disobey and disbelieve God's word as those who reject him were destined and appointed to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. Father, as we read from your precious word, we are just reminded once again that all things come from you. 
that all good things are from you, that everything we have comes from you, that you are our all in all, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we just love and honor you, Jesus. So, Father, I just pray that as I bring forth the words that you have given me, as I try to unpack this wonderful, marvelous letter, that you will inhabit my words, that they will go forth with your power, that they will go forth, Father, to do and to achieve the purposes that you would have them achieve in each person's heart today. That it would all be for your glory, for your kingdom's sake, Father, that it would be nothing of me and all of you, and that you will reach out and touch hearts, minds, and lives this day with the power of your word. Hallelujah. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, the word so, or therefore in some translations, at the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, links the admonitions of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 with the key concepts of brotherly love, which was 1 Peter 1, 22, being born again, which was 1 Peter 1 verse 23, and the power of the word of God, which was 1 Peter 1, Verse 25, it is because of these three things that we are commanded to lay aside all which follows. In fact, the word rendered to be done with in the Amplified and lay aside in other translations is the Greek word apotithemi. Now you try and say that ten times quickly. Apotithemi. It's Strong's reference 659, which basically means to strip off all of your clothes, to cast aside the filthy rags you were wearing so that you can put on the new robes of righteousness which Christ alone can supply. What follows are things in our lives which come in opposition to these three key concepts that we noted in 1 Peter 1, verses 22 to 25. Let me quote verse 1 again, this time from the more familiar King James, which says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking." So you can see, it follows on from the previous chapter. Because of all of those, wherefore, therefore, so, laying aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. I really like what Jameson Fawcett Brown has to say about this verse. Let me quote it for you also. This is from Jameson Fawcett Brown. The vices here are those which offend against the brotherly love inculcated above. Each succeeding one springs out of that which immediately proceeds, so as to form a genealogy of the sins against love. Out of malice springs guile. Out of guile hypocrisies, pretending to be what we are not and not showing what we really are, the opposite of love unfeigned and without dissimulation. Out of hypocrisies, envies of those to whom we think ourselves obliged to, pay, to play the hypocrite. Out of envies, evil speaking, malicious envious detraction of others. And I really like this little uh, summation in a, in a sense. 
he finishes with this. Guile is the permanent disposition. Hypocrisies, the acts flowing from it. The guileless knows no envy. That's the end of the quote. I'll read that last bit again, because I think it's really succinct. Guile is the permanent disposition, and hypocrisies are the acts flowing from it. The guileless knows no envy. These vices enumerated here in verse 1 should have no part in your Christian walk. If they hold whatsoever anything, any hold whatsoever on any part of your life, then you need to deal with them here, today, before you leave this building. Not only are they holding you back from being all that you should be in Christ, but they could be leading you to the pit. Yes, it's that serious. I remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jeff talking about language and and things we shouldn't say. It is that serious. You be really... All of those things that are listed in that first verse, we must get rid of them for the filthy rags that they are. They should have no part in any aspect of our lives and our walk with the Lord. It really is important. Verse 2 confuses some people. And... I've known others who attempt to use it to claim the Bible contradicts itself. This is most certainly not the case. Verse 2, like newborn babies, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk that by it you may be nurtured and grow into completed salvation. Most translations further add of the word after milk, and it well fits the context. And some manuscripts don't have the words unto salvation in them either, though many do. And that also fits the context of the verse. However, that's not where the controversy is. The primary contention seems to have developed from a misunderstanding of purpose when people compare this verse to two others which appear to be contradictory. You'll know them. The first one, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 2, which in the New King James says, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now, you are still not able. And then the other well-known one is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 5, 12 and 13, still in the New King James. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The issue being raised in 1 Peter is not one of milk versus solid food. All right? It's not one of milk versus solid food, which is what Paul is talking about. This is totally different. But rather, it is one of attitude towards the word of God. Peter has just reminded them that they have been born again. And like newborn babes, their attitude toward the word of God should be identical to that of a newborn seeking his mother's milk. 
They should latch on to the word of God and devour it, not letting go until they're fully satisfied. It is the attitude we should have towards his word. We shouldn't be able to get enough of it. So I think that the metaphor Peter is using is most apt. The milk of the word will become solid food to help nurture us and make us grow into more mature Christians. As salvation is an ongoing process, something we mention frequently here, then studying and meditating upon that word is essential to that salvation, since it's how we grow. If we don't absorb the word, then we will starve, wither, and die. If you want to keep it simple, I like simple things sometimes, reading the word of God is like milk. When we become newborn Christians, we just want to read it. And we're just happy to read We don't know what's in there. We read it. Then, when we get further advanced, the Bible says that we are to study or meditate in the word. When we begin to study and meditate in the word, then we're getting the solid food. So reading it is good. That's the milk of the word. Studying it, meditating into it, that's when we get the solid food. All right? Now, that's just a simple way of, of, of trying to think about it. And when you're born again and you're a new Christian, you just need to read the word. You're not going to understand it all. I've been studying the word of God for <clears throat> years, and I still don't understand it all. I struggle, and I try, and I look to the Lord for it, you know. But that's the solid food. But we start out as babes with just the milk. And as newborn babes, we should be wanting as much as we can get. Hallelujah. And then as you get bigger, you still need a lot of solid food. <laughs> ah. Verse 3. Verse 3. Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, this verse is actually based on Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, verse 8 in the Amplified says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord our God is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied is the man who trusts and takes refuge in him. We can't know Jesus from afar off. We can't know anyone from afar off. Right? You just can't, you know, okay, I know people today have what, Tinder, is it? Ten, ten, well, I, all this stuff. You know, and all the troubles that seem to go on when they try to get to know somebody online. You can't, right? You can't know someone from afar off. You have to come close into their very presence to get to know them. It's the same with Jesus. We don't know him afar off. We have to come close. Close. We have to come into his presence and establish a relationship with him before we can know his goodness, his kindness. This echoes an important theme found in the book of Hebrews. Turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 8. And we'll stick with the Amplified, since I can get away with it this week. Verse 4. For it's impossible to restore and bring again to repentance those who have been once for all enlightened, who have consciously tasted, there's that word, the heavenly gift and have become sharers of the Holy Spirit, and have felt how good the word of God is, and the mighty powers of the age and the world to come. If they then deviate from the faith and turn away from their allegiance, it is impossible to bring them back to repentance. 
For because they nail upon the cross the Son of God afresh as far as they are concerned and are holding him up to contempt and shame and public disgrace. For the soil which has drunk the rain that repeatedly falls upon it and produces vegetation useful to those for whose benefit it is cultivated, partakes of a blessing from God. But if that same soil persistently bears thorns and thistles, it is considered worthless and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. I don't wish to dwell on the warnings inherent in these verses. But it's always worthwhile to be reminded of them. Never take your salvation and your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ lightly. There are eternal consequences. Do not nail Christ to the cross a second time for your sins. That is one of the major errors perpetrated by the Church of Rome who keep our Lord permanently nailed to that cross. I've written an article which will hopefully probably not get around to publishing in, on the website till next year called the Cross and the Crucifix. It's a really interesting study on the significance and the difference. And I remember as a little child, I used to almost envy the Roman Catholics because they had a better looking cross. We just had this little plain thing and they had this one with the car figure. And I didn't understand the significance then, but I do now. Jesus is not still on the cross. We don't nail him up there every day. We don't keep him there. He's risen. He's sitting at the right hand of the Almighty. You can't nail him up there again. He said, it's finished. That's it. Hallelujah. Oh. Where were up? Verse 4 to 8 of 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's go there. Verses 4 to 8. Focus on one of the most significant metaphors in the entire Bible and my central theme today. That of Jesus being a living stone. Let's read them again before we examine them closely. Verse 4. Come to him then, to that living stone, which men tried and threw away but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come, and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For thus it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, honored, precious chief cornerstone. And he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, and relies on him, shall never be disappointed or put to shame. To you then who believe, who adhere to, trust in, and rely on him, is the preciousness. But for those who disbelieve, it is true. The very stone which the builders rejected has become the main cornerstone and a stone that will cause stumbling and a rock that will give men offense. They stumble because they disobey and disbelieve God's word as those who reject him were destined and appointed to do. The things presented here are also found in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Verse 4 is a clear reference to Psalm 118. Verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22 says, you'll all know it, 
The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Here then is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, rejected by those he came to serve. We saw this same theme of rejection in my series on Isaiah, most notably in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 in verse 3 says, He was despised and rejected and forsaken by men. A man of sorrows and pains, and acquainted with grief and sickness, and like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not appreciate his worth or have any esteem for him. This is the living stone Peter is writing about in this epistle. One which is precious in the sight of Almighty God. It's interesting to note that the word Peter uses for stone is lithos, L-I-T-H-O-S, strong reference 3037, and not petra, pebble. Jesus was to be the living foundation stone of the church not Peter, who makes no such claim anywhere himself. Jesus, the lethos, the living stone, is the foundation upon which the church is built. That's the rock, that's the stone, not the pebble. Consider for a moment all that's implied by comparing Christ to a living stone. A word which is elsewhere rendered millstone, stumbling block, cornerstone, building block, foundation stone, protection, and refuge. He is all of these and more. This metaphor was, in effect, actually used by our Lord when confronting the religious leaders of the day concerning the temple. We remember from the book of John, his confrontation after clearing the temple of the merchants. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22 in the New King James. John 2, verses 18 to 22, you'll know it well. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. He was the living temple while the religious leaders were focused solely on the one made of dead stones. In fact, the word used by Peter for stones can also be used to refer to the dead stone idols used by the surrounding nations. Remember, God designed the tabernacle, not the temple. That was the creation of well-meaning men. Perhaps there's a warning there too, something to think about. The next few verses also have a base in the prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah 8, verses 14 and 15 in the New King James say this. Isaiah 8, verse 14. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap 
and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In verse 15, which is very similar to 1 Peter 2, verse 8, and many among them shall stumble, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Compare the two verses, you'll see. The things we've been considering today are all encompassed in another passage from Isaiah, which I feel sure Peter had in mind when he wrote this letter. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 to 16, still in the New King James. Isaiah 28, beginning at verse 9. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Now here comes verse 16. Here comes the whole. Verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. These two passages from Isaiah ascribe seven titles to this living stone. He will be a sanctuary. He will be a stumbling block. He will be a rock of offense. He will be a trap or snare. He will be a foundation stone. He will be a tried or tested stone. And finally, a precious cornerstone. Seven is the number of spiritual perfection and completeness. The same theme is found um, in Romans as well. Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33. Romans 9, 30 to 33 in the New King James. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. 
for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Let's briefly consider each of these seven titles. He is first a sanctuary, a safe place of protection and rest from the attacks of the enemy. Proverbs 18 and verse 10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. We sing that chorus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 says this. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He is a stumbling block and an offense, two and three, as we noted in the passage from Romans chapter nine primarily to the Jewish people, as he was not the Messiah they expected. Many Jews also considered it offensive that he associated with sinners and that his gospel, his sacrifice, was not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. A couple of other verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. You'll know this one well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who were called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. One more there, Galatians 5.11. Galatians 5.11. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. The cross is an offense. The offense of the cross. Next, he appears as a trap or snare to those who get caught up in the ways of the world. Luke chapter 21, verses 33 to 36. Luke 21, beginning at verse 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Verse 35. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. His being a foundation stone needs only one verse for confirmation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 11, very simple. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.
No arguing with that. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The sixth is that of a tried or tested stone. He faced many trials, temptations, and testings on our behalf. So he understands completely what we ourselves must face. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. Hebrews 2, 18. In the Amplified. For because he himself, in his humanity has suffered in being tempted, tested, and tried, he is able immediately to run to the cry of, to assist and relieve those who are being tempted and tested and tried, and who therefore are being exposed to suffering. A couple of pages over in chapter 4 of Hebrews, and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation, but one who has been tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. And finally, he is the precious cornerstone mentioned earlier in Psalm 118 and later confirmed once more in the book of Acts by Peter himself. Acts chapter 4 and verse 11 says this. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders which has become the chief cornerstone. And then Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 to 22. Verse 20, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined bound, welded together harmoniously, and it continues to rise, to grow and increase into a holy temple in the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. In him, and in fellowship with one another, you yourselves are also being built up into this structure with the rest, to form a fixed abode, a dwelling place of God in, by, and through the Spirit. This, then, is the living stone Peter is writing about in chapter 2 of 1 Peter. The one long prophesied by Isaiah and others the great Messiah who would come to save the world, but whom the world would reject as a stumbling block and an offense. Things have not changed in 2,000 years. Much of the world still rejects him. Much of the world can't but stumble over his teachings while giving lip service to some of it. Many still find his words an offense in this so-called modern, enlightened generation. They don't realize that they don't walk in enlightenment but stumble around in darkness. You know, as you look at things today, I, the, today, if people stand up for the word of God, preach the word of God, or try to express it, they tell us we're speaking hate. They said we're speaking words. Now, I have never met Margaret Court. I only know that she was a great tennis player. She's now a minister out in Western Australia. 
she is reviled whenever her name comes up because she speaks the word of God, preaches truth from a pulpit. And they want to take her name off the tennis court in her honor. They, all in, and I'm going, you know, what has the world come to? When if you stand up and speak the truth of the word of God, you try to preach the word of God, you try to show forth God's love, we're called, we're full of hate. We don't have any hate in our hearts. We're trying to show forth the love of God, but they don't want to hear it. It's what the Bible says. They call good evil and evil good. And that's where the world has, is slowly getting worse and worse and worse. The key question here, though, the challenge is who is Jesus to you? Is he your living stone, your sanctuary, your firm foundation, the cornerstone of your life, tried and tested in all ways? Or is he the rock of offense, the stumbling block which you can't seem to overcome? So you simply rejected him. To help you answer this most important question, let me leave you with the words of Jesus, the living stone. In Luke chapter 20, verses 17 and 18. Luke 20, verses 17 and 18. Musicians, you might want to get ready to come back, please. But Jesus looked at them and said, what then is the meaning of this that is written? The very stone which the builders rejected has become the chief stone of the corner, the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken in pieces, but upon whomever it falls, it will crush him, winnow him, and scatter him as dust. When you fall on the living stone Christ Jesus, all your old ways will be broken. And he, by the Holy Spirit, will rebuild you to be like him. However, all those upon whom this stone eventually falls in judgment will be utterly and totally crushed and destroyed. Which will it be? The choice is yours to make.